This time, in 1986. You and I. That's right. When I was mayor of Shanghai. That's right. It was on a roof, out of doors. Near out of doors, near the Huangpu River. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, I'm very happy to meet you again today. And I, you, and I thank you very much for granting us this interview. You know, Mr. President, you took over a little bit more than 10 years ago, right? Widely perceived to be a transitional figure. You were not going to be number one. You were, you were going to spend a few years running the country and then somebody more decisive and somebody stronger and so forth was going to uh, take over. But you confounded the skeptics. You took charge and you're still very much in charge. Why do you believe that perhaps you were underestimated? I was the mayor and then the party secretary in Shanghai. In fact, I did not think that I would be transferred to the central committee here in Beijing. But finally, I was the man who was selected. Dong Xiaoping and other leaders of the older generation wanted me to become general secretary of the Communist Party. I did not expect this. However, I've been in this position for 11 years, and I've always held the conviction that I need to do my very best to serve my country and my motherland. And maybe it was because of my hard work and my diligence that I still have the job. The, the shorter answers, you know the United States. Shorter answers, please, more concise. <laughs> but I think my answer is roughly the same length as your question. I know it. I, that's absolutely true. <laughs> if you make concise and brief questions, I'll give you a brief answer. You are called by some the silk-wrapped needle. Is that one reason for your success? Or what does it mean? People use the same phrase to describe the character of Zhong Xiaoping. I don't think I should be put on a par with Zhang. But one thing for myself is that, for sure, is that I am a decisive figure. But that also would seem to mean you're a tough figure, a needle. In fact, a needle wrapped in silk is a very high compliment in Chinese, so I think I should be more modest. You studied the speeches of Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln as a youngster mm. when you were learning English? In fact, I was in middle school. And later, when I was a teacher in the night school in Shanghai, I also selected Lincoln's Gettysburg Address as part of my course. And maybe you want me to quote some lines from that speech. I do indeed. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Why, why did you learn that by heart? I'm particularly interested in the phrase, all men are created equal. All men are created equal. Because this was a great influence on the students when I was in middle school. And I think what Abraham Lincoln described in his article still remains the goal of American leaders today. Especially the last paragraph, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, never perish from those. But Abraham Lincoln was elected by the people. Uh, right? That's right. Why is it that Americans can elect their national leaders, but you apparently don't trust the Chinese people to elect your national leaders. Why? I also believe that I am an elected leader, although we use different ways of election. The only difference between China and the United States on this specific question is the different systems of election that we use in our two countries. Because China has its own historical tradition, its own level of education, of economic development and social development, and so on. So I think each country should have its own individual system of election. Of course. 
But I don't understand still why you have a one-party state. What would happen? What would happen in China if there were two or three parties? Isn't it conceivable that, as in the United States, the competition between the parties to represent the majority of the people in that country make for a better country? Why is it necessary to have opposition parties? It shows that you don't understand Chinese history. Americans think the whole world should adopt American values and the American political system. I don't think that is wise. It's not the American. It is the British. It is the German. It is the French. It is... I mean, it, it's all over the world. You are the last major dictatorship, the, the last major communist dictatorship in the world. You mean a um, dictatorship? Well, of course. A developmental dictatorship is what, <laughs> is what we believe it is. Am I wrong? Of course. This is big mistake. Big mistake. Of course. Yes. This shows you don't know China that well. Oh, I don't know China that well. Yeah, I've been here yeah. half a dozen times. What means dictatorship? Dictatorship? When you do not have freedom of the press. And there is not freedom of the press here. There is not. That's a perfect example. You mean China? There's not... Here, here. here uh, in China, yes. China. We see a connection between freedom of the people and freedom of the press. You have said the press should be the mouthpiece of the party. You've also said, as Mao Zedong did, newspapers must be run by politicians. What do you fear from a free press? I think for any individual country or any individual party, they always have their own publications to promote their own ideology. As I explained to you, the Chinese system is a multi-party system led by the Communist Party. And we do have freedom of the press. We have over 2,000 TV stations in the country. We have more than 2,000 local newspapers and more than 8,000 magazines. We publish more than 100,000 new books each year. You had never served in the armed forces of China, right? Correct. One of the most important parts of your job you're the chairman of the Central Military Commission of the Military, right? Military Committee. Military Committee. A man who has never served in the armed forces, like Bill Clinton. You have been tough on the army, haven't you? Uh, you were right. I never served in the army in the military because I am an intellectual. In the United States, intellectuals serve in the army, Mr. President. That's true. Having said that, though, I have served as chairman of the Central Military Commission for 11 years. I think I have the confidence of the Army. As chairman, I don't personally need to fire a gun or fly an airplane. My responsibility is to make strategic decisions. Well, you made a very serious decision. The Army, the armed forces, used to be in business. Oh, this is my decision. I know it. Two years ago, Two years ago, you said to the army, out of business. You are the army. You are not business people. Why? I think if the army is allowed to do business, then that would erode our army. Because history has taught us that any army that is allowed to engage in business eventually becomes corrupted. And that would destroy the morale and the fighting will of the military. You were a student protester. In Shanghai. Shanghai, yeah, that's right. At the time of the nationalists, we want freedom, we want democracy. That was you. That's right. And that's what those folks, that's what those people in Tiananmen Square were saying. We want freedom, we want democracy. I first joined the student movement against the Japanese military in China. We sang our protest song, Arise, my fellow classmates, and defend the motherland.
，满耳是大众的折伤。看吧，一年年国土的人生。One more question about dictatorship. That's right. You bring up the internet. You have blocked internet sites here in China, the BBC, the Washington Post. Why? Why block an internet site? You don't trust the people somehow to be able to pick stuff. Off the internet and learn. Well, about this internet, I think we discussed this issue before when we were talking about freedom of the press. We hope that we can learn a lot of useful things and useful information from the internet. However, sometimes there is also unhealthy stuff, especially pornography, on the internet, which does great harm to our youngsters. Not from the BBC and not from the Washington Post. As for examples you have given, such as BBC and the others, they might be banned because of some of their political news reports. We need to be selective. We hope to restrict as much as possible information not conducive to China's development. You persecute Christians. You persecute something called Falun Gong. What in the world? For what reason, this spiritual undertaking, according to my understanding, and I have met the man in New York. What was his name? Lijia. Li Hongzhi. Li Li Hongzhi. I met him. You met him? Yes, I sat down with him in like this, like this, and. They do exercises. They believe in a certain spiritual life. What what is it that worries you so about Falun Gong that you torture, arrest, kill, etc.? What what is it? At first, I would like to ask you: You also trust the Falun Gong? Trust them? I I don't know enough about them. I will tell you. Li Hongji claims to be the reincarnation of the chief Buddha, and also the reincarnated Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? He said that doomsday was about to come, and he also said that the earth was going to explode. He also claims that I and Mr. Li Peng, who then was the premier, used to call him on the telephone, asking him to delay the date of the explosion of the earth, maybe for several decades. But we had never talked to him. Well, by making all these claims, he wants to achieve nothing but people's trust, people's belief in him. He wants to、uh, create the impression that he knows the Chinese leaders very well. In fact, what he says are just misleading words. In fact, as a result of his preachings, many families were broken and many lives were lost. So, after careful deliberations, we draw the conclusion that Falun Gong is a cult. Is this the Chinese equivalent of Camp David, Bedaya? It is our tradition to move our offices here every summer. But in fact, we're not having a vacation here because we conduct our normal business as we do in Beijing. Except here, we may go for a swim. My doctor often suggests that I should swim. I swam this morning for the twenty-first time this summer. It's the tradition for. Chinese leaders to swim. Mao Zedong swam. Deng Xiaoping swam. Jiang Zemin. <laughs> Who's going to be your successor? And is he, and is he a swimmer? <laughs> that may be a coincidence that we all swam, but it is true that swimming makes you feel relaxed and refreshed. When we talk about dictatorship. I'm, I'm wagging my finger at the president of China. I hope you will not send me off to. Uh, uh, you are, you are. It seems to me, a dictator, an authoritarian. No, but but、uh, I, I, very frank speaking, I don't agree with your point. I'm dictator. I know you don't. I, I know that you don't. But but but、uh, 
But it, there's an old, there's old, <laughs> an old American phrase about if it walks like a duck and 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 quacks like a duck and so forth, it's a duck. A dictator is somebody who forcibly, whether it's free press or free religion or free private enterprise, now you're, you're beginning to come a little closer to that. You, father knows best. And if you get in the way of father, father will take care of you. That's what a dictator is, in effect, politically. I think your way of describing what things are like here in China is as absurd as what the Arabian Nights may sound like. The reality in China is that we have leadership by the Communist Party. According to law, the party only makes recommendations. Everything needs to be approved by the National People's Congress. Look, one last question. Dictatorship. Mm. You know what? When I see the picture mm. of that one young man mm. in front of the tank mm. in Tiananmen Square, mm -hmm. that to me means mm. Chinese dictatorship. Mm. That's a wonderful symbol that hits, hits me in my heart mm. about dictatorship in China. I don't need translation. I know, I know. what you say. <laughs> I'm very willing to answer these questions because Barbara Walters of ABC had asked me the same question about 10 years ago and gave me a photo. And I said this young man was not arrested and did not get hurt because the tank stopped in front of him and refused to crush him. And Barbara also gave me the name of who she believed was the young man, although I may have forgotten the specific name, but I asked people who were working with the public security agencies to use all of their networks to check out the whereabouts of that young man. And after a month-long investigation, I could say for sure that this young man has not been arrested. Did a part of you admire his courage. Well, we? In fact, I've never met this young man, although we're trying to search out his whereabouts. But we do know that he was never arrested. I do not know where he lives now in China, but looking from the picture, I know he definitely had his own ideas. But whether his ideas were correct ones, uh, that's an entirely different question. I cannot tell for sure who and what had influenced him. You haven't answered the question, Mr. President. Did, did a part of Zhang Zemin Admire, admire his courage. Well, in now, I know what you're driving at. But what I want to emphasize is that we fully respect people's rights to freely express their wishes and desires. But I do not favor any flagrant opposition to the government's measures during an extraordinary situation. The tank stopped and did not run over the young man. I'm not talking about the tank. I'm talking about that man's heart, that man's courage, that man, that lonely man, standing against that. You were a student protester back in the Shanghai days. In 2002, Mr. President, you are through with this term in office, yes? That's right. My term for the presidency will end in 2003 and for general secretary in 2002. 2002, 2003, are you going to, do you intend to give up any of your three posts? Oh, you ask very sharp, tough questions. Well, I'm afraid I can't give you a definitive answer today at this moment because what will happen will be decided through our democratic system.